We are done with the big four, if you will, the, the first group um, of disciples, and we have the most information, uh, for the most part, about them, at least in terms of the biblical story. The one exception to that might be Judas, just because of what he is obviously known for. So the uh, Bible has a lot to say about him. Um, we know a little bit about Matthew because he's writing the gospel, stuff like that. But for the most part, those first four that we, we looked at, uh, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, uh, we, we have the most about. Um, but, the, but, but for the rest, we don't have as much. I didn't grab the... Uh... There we go. So Philip and uh, Nathaniel. Uh, let's start with just some... Uh, by the way, I think this is both of them. Um, and you can't read what's up there, so let's just pretend it is them. So I did my best to get a picture of both of them together. You do see them together uh, virtually almost every time. Uh, you rarely see them uh, separated from, from each other. Um, Don, I may need your help. I bet something popped up. Um, but you remember that the disciples are broken down into three groups of four. So we've looked at the first group, and you remember that each group is um, the, the first name is always the same. Thank you. Uh, so in the first group, Peter is always the first name mentioned. In the second group, Philip is the first name mentioned. So, so here are three examples of that. Philip, Nathaniel, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew. Uh, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas. <laughs> Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, right? The, the, the order that follows that first name differs, but the first name is always the same. So the theory is that you have the 12 disciples, which is a collective group, but within the 12, you have it broken down into three groups, and each group has a, a sort of leader, okay? uh, someone that sort of represents that group. So Peter, obviously for the first group, and he does a lot of the talking, uh, also representing the 12, and then Philip representing the, the next group. Um, and it is a reminder that Jesus' uh, approach to discipleship wasn't large crusades. It was small discipleship. Um, and this has been the model of Christianity for 2,000 years. I think the big error we've made as Americans is we bought into the, the, the system of bigger is better. Uh, and there isn't anything wrong with crusades or anything like that. But, but it robbed us from true discipleship. So, so if you were discipling two people, you're doing literally the Lord's work because that's what the Lord did. Um, and the idea is that if you disciple two, they each disciple two. Uh, it's, it's like the, the uh, old question, would you take a million dollars now or would you like to start with a penny today and double it each day uh, for a month? Which would you choose? Well, the discipleship model is that doubling. So you may disciple two at a time, but if those two disciple two and they disciple two, um, then, then you have the, the ripple effect from there. Let's look at some uh, just basic information about uh, Philip. Um, his name means lover of horses. There you go. Uh, so Philip's going to be your favorite. Uh, and I guess my daughter as well loves horses. So Philip is from Kentucky. Uh, it is fascinating that uh, Philip is uh, a Greek name. Um, and we're never given his Jewish name. We talked about this some last week with Andrew. Andrew's a, a Greek name. Uh, and this gives us insight into the cultural setting. Uh, remember that uh, although uh, Judea uh, and Israel was very Jewish to the frustration of Rome, um, that doesn't mean they weren't influenced by the culture around them. This has been a struggle with Christianity, um, is, is how do we maintain pure Christianity with, by, and still incarnate it within the culture that, that is found? So the expression of Christianity theologically is the same wherever it goes, but its expression may be a little different uh, from uh, Niger, Africa to uh, Glendine, Kentucky, right? Uh, the, the expression is going to be a little different. So what you have here is some of the disciples is Galilee, is the northern part of Judea. It's, it's the more Hellenized. By that, I mean it's more Greek. Um, and so when Alexander the Great comes uh, and, and takes over the, the world, basically, um, he doesn't just take over everything, he brings with them um, Greek culture. And so even though uh, the Jews are wanting to maintain their religious identity, there is still a cultural identity that is there. For one, they're all speaking Greek in the Roman world. Uh, but also there comes with it names, uh, uh, practices, and other stuff. And so 
uh, being a good Jew who names your child Philip and, 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 and Andrew uh, suggests there is some, uh, some Greek influence in, in Galilee, which shouldn't be surprising. So not all the, Jew, all the disciples have pure Jewish names, and we're only given the Greek names for, for, for Andrew uh, or Philip. Um, and let me just add that uh, when we speak of Philip, we should not confuse him with another Philip. Right? Um, uh, this is the problem with uh, names like this. Uh, my father-in-law believes that um, simple names, like old school simple names, are, are what should come back, right? It, we're naming our kids Apple and Banjo at this point. I mean, it is just ridiculous. And if, ladies, if you don't have a Y in your child's name, do you really love them? Right? So, so you have to misspell your child's name by putting a Y in there instead of an I or some other vowel. Otherwise, you're just not cool, I guess. Uh, we're just coming up with weird names nowadays. Uh, every, every time I coach a team, I know I'm not going to be able to pronounce half the names. It's ridiculous. So my father-in-law complains all the time. Whatever happened to the old names? Bob and Bill and Cindy and Sally, right? What's wrong with those names? Uh, well, in the Bible, they use the same names over and over again. So there's 40 Marys, right? Uh, several Simons and, and all that. Uh, well, Philip, there's at least two guys. There's Philip the Apostle, and then there's Philip the Deacon. And so when you think of Philip, you probably think of the deacon. He's the one that leads the uh, eunuch uh, to Christ. Um, and so next to Stephen the deacon, he, he has uh, some ink spilled on him. Um, by the way, uh, John 144, uh, we get this information. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. This is significant because it suggests that Peter, Andrew, and Philip likely attended the same synagogue uh, and may have played together in the community growing up. Uh, and, and it's very possible, to, MacArthur suggests this in his book, uh, up to maybe even half of the disciples were fishermen who kind of fished together. Um, and there's reasons why they say that. One, we know at least four of them did. And then you can add at the end of John when Peter goes back to fishing again. You may remember that Nathaniel, some others go fishing with him. So it's very possible over half the disciples knew each other as fishermen in the redneck part of town. Uh, and it's very possible Philip is one of them. So, so imagine here's, here's these group of boys who knew each other. They went to the same high school. Uh, and it is these guys who weren't voted anything in their class turn out to change the world because they follow Jesus. I just think that that is significant. Um, in terms of uh, uh, what does the Bible say about Philip, outside of these listings in the synoptics, Philip is never mentioned in the first three Gospels. Synoptics means same, Matthew, Mark, Luke, because they're very similar. They're probably borrowing from each other. Uh, so if all we had were Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we wouldn't know anything about Philip other than his name. That'd be all we would be able to tell. Uh, so we have to really rely on the Gospel of John. In fact, that, that little detail right there comes from John's Gospel. Um, and uh, um, so we are limited to his Gospel for, for information. Uh, but one thing we should know that he's always paired with Nathaniel or Bartholomew, um, suggesting that the two were close, may have known each other for several years. MacArthur puts this, piecing together all the apostle John records about Philip, it seems Philip was a classic process person. He was a facts and figures guy, a by-the-book, practical-minded, non-forward-thinking type of individual. Can I just pause there? That is too many dashes in a single sentence. I don't know, did, does that stick out to anyone, or, or do I have a problem? Uh, it's okay, I was born that way, identify that way, and if you judge me, you're a bigot. I could run for president. Uh, he was the kind who tends to be a, a corporate killjoy, pessimistic, narrowly focused, sometimes missing the big picture, often obsessed with identifying reasons things can't be done rather than finding ways to do them. He was predisposed to be a pragmatist and a cynic and sometimes a defeatist rather than a visionary. So I hope to encourage you this evening right, with a, with a description like that. But chances are you know people like this. You may be one of those people. I don't know. Um, MacArthur once in a sermon said that if, 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 uh, if you can avoid it, don't hire a negative person. Don't work with them. If you can't help that, give them their own office. If you can't do that, give them their own building. If you can't do that, just don't let them come into work. Whatever you do, stay away from negative people. Yeah. I actually think that's, I mean, he's being sarcastic, but I think that's some, some good advice. Um, it is amazing how easier it is for negative people to, to 
uh, just to saturate the room than a positive person. All right. Um, and uh, uh, so I, I think there's some real to it. And Philip seems to be this sort of guy. He's, he's the administrator of the 12, is the way I like to think of him. Uh, whereas Peter doesn't have time to think of administration. He's visionary. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Philip will take care of the details, right? That's, that's, that's the way I am. I don't like administration. I just, hey, let's just go do something and have fun with it. Philip is the guy saying, well, you know, I've checked the budget and it can't be done. Uh, which is why Philip never ran for office, because you don't need a budget if you're working for federal government. Uh, in terms of Nathaniel, uh, in the synoptics, his name is Bartholomew. Again, my favorite name, uh, which is a name we need to bring back. Uh, we need more Bartholomews. Uh, but in John, his name is Nathaniel. And so some people will suggest that the Bible can't get the 12 disciples' names right, and that's just foolishness. Chances are uh, you... Uh, know someone by name that maybe their family members don't. I still remember the first time I met my in-laws, they all referred to my wife as Mandy. Uh, who is that? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know a Mandy. Like my sister, my dad calls her Mandy. Everyone else called her Amanda. To me, she's sis. Right? And, and I meet all the Phillipses, like Mandy this and Mandy that. Is there, is there another like, cousin I need to meet? What is this? Uh, but she wanted me to call her Amanda, uh, so I did. And I'm not going to call her Mandy. That just weirds me out right now. Uh, but the rest of her family does, right? And you can, I, I've accepted when I knew they were from Carroll County that they were going to be weird. Um, so uh, Bartholomew just means son of Ptolemy or something like that. It's, it's a weird name. So his name is probably Nathaniel, son of, and then, then his dad. So that's probably what the Bartholomew is. Um, so Nathaniel is probably his proper name. Uh, the synoptics in Acts include no real information about him. Again, we can go back to this list, and this is pretty much all you're going to get on Nathaniel from the synoptics. So we have to, again, rely on John, uh, which, is, which is striking that John gives us more details about some of these lesser-known disciples. We do know that Nathaniel is from Canaan, Cana, rather, which is the site where Jesus' first miracle was performed, um, which makes you wonder, did Nathaniel have a family connection or just an upbringing connection to some of Jesus' family. Jesus is invited to the wedding for a reason, uh, and, and you don't get invited to a wedding unless people want you there. All right, they have some uh, prior connection uh, to you. All right, let's start in John chapter 1. Um, John chapter 1, verse 35 to 51. It's the first time we meet these cats. It says, uh, The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, as John the Baptist. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. Remember, there's four L's in John 1. Logos, light, life, and lamb. All right? uh, hopefully you'll never forget that. Because if, you, if your theology is those four words, your theology is pretty solid. Uh, you'll never get a TBN show, but your theology would be solid nonetheless. Um, the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following him and said to them, uh, what are you seeking? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher. Uh, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about the 10th hour, about 4 p.m. Uh, one of the two who heard John speak fall Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. We looked at that last week. Verse 42, uh, 43 rather. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip, said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of God. Now, how is that going to fix your checking account? Right? Ever read the Bible and think, well, that's a cute story. What's that got to do um, with the price of bread in China? Whatever the phrase actually is, I get it wrong, but 
Who cares? Okay. A um, couple of things to note here. First of all, verse 35 to 42, we see that Jesus calls, verbally calls, Andrew and Peter and John in the wilderness who have been studying uh, and, and were disciples of John the Baptist, right? So, so in John's account, uh, which doesn't contradict the synoptics, uh, Jesus goes and calls uh, uh, them, right? Um, and then the next day, verses 43 to 51, Jesus then calls Philip and Nathaniel, right? So on the first thing, you have John the Baptist. When Jesus appears to come get his boys, John the Baptist says, go follow him. That's the lamb, the one I've been talking about. But when we get the story of Philip and Nathaniel, it, it's changed just a little bit. Jesus purposely seeks them out and calls them. So in the first story, Jesus is in partnership with John the Baptist. Uh, and John the Baptist ushers them to Jesus. But with Philip and Nathaniel, Jesus brings them into the fold. That's important uh, because um, of, of what it is we, we have here. Verse 45, notice Philip found Nathaniel, said to him, we have found him of whom Moses' law wrote about in the prophets. Now notice there the word we. We found him. But that's not what the story was, is it? The story is Jesus found them. So which is it? One option is John forgot what he wrote in the previous verse. Right? Let me give you some advice whenever people point out contradictions. Um, if you write something, you don't forget what you wrote in the previous verse. A great example of this is Genesis 1 and 2. We talked about this in January. Remember that? You know, when, when things were normal? And, and uh, yeah, yeah, it was, my goodness, it was uh, three decades ago. We, we was the month of January, and it was delightful. You remember that Genesis 1 tells the six days of creation. Uh, Genesis 2 focuses in on day six. But what a lot of people do is, see, contradictions. Two different stories of creation. And you read it, and you're thinking, man, had only Moses not forgotten what he wrote on the first page. Now that he's on page two. Right? It's a ridiculous notion. It really is. Um, and so you've got to get beyond that surfacey sort of thing. And you could do it here. Um, but, but it's actually the theology here is quite rich. So which is it? Did Jesus call Philip and Nathaniel or did they seek Jesus and follow him? Yes. It's good theology. It's both and. So you get in John's gospel. John really uh, intersects with this. Is, is like John 6 is a good example where Jesus says, uh, those who follow me, I call. At the same time, Peter stands up and says, where else are we going to go? We're following you. Well, which is it? Is it because Jesus called or is it because, Jesus, because they followed? Yes. The answer is yes. Both God's sovereignty and, and agency is, is, is here. Uh, but what we should see in verse 45 is it is clear that Nathan and Philip have been studying scriptures and have been seeking the Messiah. And when they encounter Jesus, particularly Philip... He concludes, based on scriptural evidence, that Jesus is that person. And given uh, their connection in Galilee, where they likely have, they know each other. Um, Jesus is, again, probably related to, to Peter. Um, was it Peter or was it John? I, I can't remember. Anyways, uh, probably some relation there. So it's very possible that Jesus uh, may have grown up with uh, Philip and others, or at least had seen each other. Maybe they all traveled to Jerusalem together, go to the temple, something like that. So uh, it's possible that Philip, as well as some of the other disciples, knew Jesus as a little boy and knew him whenever he was in middle school and he had adolescence and went through the punk rock stage, right? They, they knew him and knew he was, uh, really was the real deal. Um, and so they're seeking scripture and they conclude he is, he is precisely that. Uh, but then verse 46, we see that Nathaniel's from Canaan, which is north of Nazareth. And, and we, should, we should note here that his language is just funny to me. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, I'm from Owen County. I grew up with this sort of rhetoric, mm -hmm. right? So when, when, I, when I went to uh, work at, for a high schooler, it was my dream job to be the music manager of Family Christian Stores in Florence, Kentucky. The, the people's opinion of me was clearly driven by my hometown, right? And I still remember the interview. Uh, the assistant manager, who, who I, I love to this day, we still talk and uh, have uh, inside jokes back, to, you know, back and forth. Um, he, he looked at me just, I don't know if I had a child who was 16, I'd let him drive an hour to go to work. I remember thinking, look, Hoss, here's the thing. I've got to drive an hour to go grocery shopping anyways. I'd like to get paid for it. 
Like, just because you ain't from where I'm from, don't, don't, don't judge me. And let's be honest. When, when the word got out that this kid from Moyne County is going to come and, and do a trial sermon, you immediately sized me up. I'd already sized y'all up, state workers, right? I mean, I already do. We won't get nothing done. The amount of committees I bet this church has, right? Actually, that is true. That is exactly what I thought of you all before I even met you. Frankfurt, oh, the committees and the business meeting is probably all they do there, right? It's all they know. Um, but, uh, uh, so, but it also makes you think that there is a rivalry between the two communities, Canaan and Nazareth. Nazareth is probably a little larger. Uh, so you've got the smaller town uh, talking smack to the larger town. And by larger, right, I mean it's... Not by much, right? You wouldn't call it a large town now. Uh, it's like growing up, uh, Owen and Carroll County were big robberies. Uh, pretty much if you bordered Owen County, we didn't like you, right? That's just, just the way we were. Um, I remember um, I was playing basketball against some guys from Carroll County, and uh, they go, yeah? And we call them river rats because that's what they are. Just that's my wife and her family. And they say, oh, yeah? We all a bunch of rednecks. She's like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> river rat? Redneck, like I've made peace with God with the redneck thing. Like at least like country music likes us, okay? <laughs> right? I mean, no one likes you, River Rats. No one does. Uh, so just leave. And in fact, it got even worse when growing up, the uh, boys' high school basketball coach for Owen County and the boys' high school coach for Carroll County were twin brothers. And, and this, I'm not making this up. And, and the only difference between them, their identical twin brothers, uh, was the Carroll County dude had a mustache. Right? So every year when the two teams would play, it's a big deal because the Mefford brothers are going at it. Right? And, and one brother didn't want the other brother to, uh, uh, to win. So uh, you get small town rivalries. And we get this here. I just find this hilarious. Well, can anything good come out of Nazareth? But what is striking is that in John's gospel, this comes up multiple times. One example is in John chapter 9, where the Pharisees tells the, the man born blind that Jesus healed. He says, check your scripture. No prophet comes from Galilee. And they're wrong. Jonah is from Galilee. So there is this notion that, that's in John's gospel. This may, may give us insight to the eyewitness part of John, that he knew sort of, what people thought of Jesus beyond uh, just the, the more outward stuff, there is this sense of he can't be the Messiah because of cultural realities. He talks funny like all those Galileans. No one important ever comes from, from Galilee. And, and even within Galilee, no one thought the Messiah would come from Nazareth. Right? It, it's just beautiful. It's in the narrative, and you'll think about it until you really just stop and read the gospel with that, with that in, in mind. Um, that's why whenever people ask where anything about Owen County, like our one claim to fame is recent, Carson Williams, the uh, uh, Mr. Basketball. But even when he won Mr. Basketball, people like took the year off with high school basketball. Like, like people can tell you all about Mr. Basketball like every year except the year Carson Williams from Owen County won it. It just drives me crazy. It drives me crazy. He was at a tournament at the Yum Center. And, and, and I, cause I remember watching it, and, and people were like, wow, who's that guy? It's Mr. Basketball. He was on TV. He's like in your manual. Well, I didn't know him. I was like, because he's from Owen County, I guess. I don't know. I get rather sensitive about this. But I do find his, his response quite, quite striking. Um, but what is important is what Jesus says to Nathanael in verses 47 to 51. First thing he says is, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Right? And, and this is a, a theology throughout the Bible, right? There are those who are Israelite by birth, and there are those who are Israelite by faith. And, and this is developed particularly by Paul, is that even Gentiles can be sons of Abraham. One, literally, they can be sons of Abraham because Abe had other wives. We'll skip that part when we go back to Genesis. Um, but, but, but theologically, uh, to be a true Jew isn't a matter of circumcision. It's a matter of the heart. And so Jesus says, here's a guy who's got it going on. This is a true Israelite who isn't just going through the motions of religion. This is someone who is seeking the scriptures, who, who, who obeys Yahweh with all that he has. And here Jesus does two things with Nathaniel. Uh, the first is he demonstrates his omniscience. I mean, I know we live in a digital age where people know what you're doing. Like uh, when we first moved here, we had Redbox. Like 
I know Red Box was slowly going the way of the Buffalo, but that was like awesome to us. You know what we had in Breckenridge County? Direct TV or Dish TV is what we had, right? That was it. If it wasn't on live, or last year we had DVR, not to brag, <laughs> but, but if it wasn't live, you didn't watch it. You know, some of you all remember those days of three channels, right? And, and you as a child were the remote control. Uh, that's what we had. We moved here, we had Redbox. And then with Redbox, they would send you an email whenever you, you return the DVD. And I remember I sitting in the office and, and I had my email pulled up and I get this email saying, thank you for returning your movie. And I text Amanda, Mandy, and said, hey, I bet you're at the Redbox at CVS Pharmacy over here in East Main. And she started to freak out. Are you following me? What's going on? Well, you know, and also like, look, I got an email, right? I think that's hilarious, right? And with our alarm system, I can tell you what door you just opened and when you opened it and whether or not you, you remember to set it, all that sort of, it is kind of creepy, right? Now, now imagine if, if you're just, you know, at the park, on the bench, in the shade, heat of summer, and then an hour later, someone says, oh yeah, I saw you there. You think, stay away from me. But Nathaniel knows what Jesus is doing here. This is a, a sign of omniscience. But it isn't just that. But Jesus demonstrates his identity. That phrase that he has there um, in verse 51, he said to Nathaniel, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of God. Where does that happen in the Gospel of John? I don't think it does. Someone can correct me doesn't happen at the transfiguration of the synoptics either. Can you think of a time when the angels ascend and descend to God? At best, maybe the temptation when the angels come to minister to Jesus, but no one sees it. Maybe Jesus has something more in mind here than just, you're going to see me hanging out with the angels. Uh, you can bookmark this, but turn back with me to Genesis chapter 28. We'll probably explore this more if we ever get to Genesis 28. Um, it'll still be in 2020 because the year will never end, but 10 years we'll look at it. Genesis 28, let's look at verse 10 to 19. This is Jacob's ladder, no rock, Christian rock band. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. Um, and he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. He came to a certain place. That is a man-given directions, isn't it? That just clicked. I've never read that before. He came to a certain place, right? Three miles out of town to the right is called a certain place. <laughs> that is funny to me. That's the difference between men and women. You don't care about this. Is The men you will use road numbers. Take 42, turn right on 16, you're right there. Women give... Um, I don't want to be uh, genderous here. Um, yeah, it's too late. Might as well just, if, if you're going to swim, you might as well dive in. Uh, women prefer landmarks. Is that safer? Right? Um, and it, it drives me crazy. So man all the time is like, you remember when we went and saw that house? We were looking for a house. It's right by there. No. We didn't buy it. And if we didn't buy it, why did I remember it? I only have so much space in the small brain. And there ain't room for that, right? Anyways, um, certain place. That is just hilarious. Um, Stay there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and laid down in that place to sleep. You thought your, your bed was uncomfortable. He dreamed, behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac, the land of which you lie, I will give to you, to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. It shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, the north, and the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. House of God is Bethel. Your, your translation say Bethel? You want to have Bethel on there? I think it's in that verse. Bethel means house of God. There is a church in Owen County called El Bethel, which means God's house of God. You do with that whatever you want. That is free. That's Owen County. Nothing good can come out of Owen County. Um, 
Now, do you see the connection between Jacob's ladder and what Jesus said to Nathaniel? What did Jacob see? Jacob had a dream of a ladder reaching all the way up to heaven. And remember, in Genesis, the theology is, though man tries to ascend to the heavens, Tower of Babel, where we left off, and I'll show you Genesis. Genesis shows us, no, what needs to happen is God needs to descend upon, uh, to earth, right? So we see that in the garden, God is walking in the garden. We see it in Noah, where come into the ark. We see the Tower of Babel. Well, God, God is, he can't find that Babel is so small. So he has to come down and look for it, right? And here we see it again, that God is coming down and the angels are ascending and descending. God is coming down in the form of this ladder. He'll do the same thing with the burning bush, where, where God in Christ is coming down to meet with Moses because Moses can't ascend. Jacob cannot ascend even the ladder, so therefore God must come down. Now, if you go back to John, what do you find? It's the same language. You will see angels ascending and descending. That is the same uh, uh, vision that Jacob has. But what is different between Jacob's vision and uh, Nathaniel's vision? The difference is there's no ladder. Because Jesus is the ladder. That's the point of the story. The point is, is that with Jacob, there is a, God is personified, if you will, in the form of a ladder. The one that bridges God and man. He comes down to be with man. In John's gospel, Jesus is the ladder. He's the son of, you will see, not a ladder, but the son of man, and the angels ascending and descending upon him. This isn't unique in John chapter 1. Look at verse 14. Right, so, so in verse 1 is, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos. Logos with God, or was God. Verse 14 is this, and the Logos uh, became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt is tabernacle. He tabernacled, verb, with us. Now, the tabernacle is God comes down to meet with man. And so in John 1, this is a theology. The Logos, the life, the light, and the Lamb all come down to be with man. He dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten Son. And then when he meets Nathaniel, that's exactly what he tells him. And that's just fantastic to see. I just love this stuff. Because if you take Jacob's ladder, that scene sticks out because of its significance in God reaffirming the promise from one generation to the next. Abraham's promise now given to uh, Isaac, and then it will be given to Jacob later on. But beyond that, we, we don't really get any, any significance with the ladder and the angels until Jesus meets Nathaniel. It's just awesome, awesome stuff. Well, with that, turn to John chapter 6 quickly, and we, we will have to, have to move. John 6. We get the uh, feeding of the 5,000. We, we saw this a little bit last week. Uh, John 6, starting in verse 4. We'll go down to verse 9. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but, where, but what are they for so many? All right, so we looked at this last week. We emphasized Andrew, his whole, be, his, his whole deal is bringing people to Jesus. Philip is an administrator. Right? He counts beans um, because he's just that sort of guy. Um, but what is striking is that in John's account of the story, the only miracle other than the resurrection in all four Gospels, in John's account, Jesus asked Philip specifically this question. Now, remember, Philip represents the second four. So Andrew is in the first four. Philip is representing the second four. But he asked Philip specifically. So you have thousands upon thousands, at least 5,000 men plus women and children. There's estimates up to twenty or 30,000 people. I don't know what it is. Uh, how are you going to feed all these people? That's a big potluck. And Philip thinks in terms of numbers. He says, look, if we had 200 denarii, if I were to divide that by 5,000 people and apply that to fish and chips, it won't work. Someone's going to have to go hungry. A lot is going to have to go hungry. Right? And Jesus was a communist, and he just won't allow that to happen. Right, Keith? Jesus was a communist? All right, I, saw, I thought so. Um, so, um, uh, so you see that Philip is thinking in terms of numbers. 
uh, because he is likely responsible for organizing basic needs. If Judas is in charge of the budget uh, or the, the treasury, um, Philip may be responsible for organizing and meeting basic needs um, and making every penny count. Um, but the real point of asking Philip this question is in the narrative to highlight the impossibility of the miracle. John could say, look, 5,000 people plus women and children, and they ain't got no food. And you would say that is impossible. You can heighten the impossibility by taking the accountant and saying, hey, accountant, do we got enough money in the bank to do this? And he says, no, we got 10 bucks. We need about 200 million. And then the viewer would say, now I know it's impossible to do. So that when Jesus takes a little boy's uh, lunch, a little lunchable, and feeds them, the reader says, I knew it was impossible, but it happened. This must be a God thing. Right? And you remember that the feeding of the 5,000 in John's gospel is associated with the Passover. Right? So, so you have the Lamb of God uh, coming to feed the people. So he is the Lamb of God. Right? So you get the Passover language, eat my body, drink my blood. All that's Passover. Jesus is the Lamb of Passover. But it also uh, fills the story of manna from heaven. Jesus will say, I am the bread of life here in John chapter 6. I have come down, which is what we saw in the story of Nathaniel. I have come down um, as the bread of life to eat my body, drink my blood. Right? Uh, so, so John, the author, wants to highlight the impossibility of feeding the masses. But then the point is, if Jesus is the bread of life, feast upon him and you'll never be hungry again. Right? That's the point. So in John 4, Jesus says, drink from my well, you'll never thirst. In John 6, eat of my flesh and you'll never go hungry again. It's a major theme in John's gospel. Right? Um, so, um, and besides, Philip was there when Jesus turned water into wine. He saw him uh, do all the other miracles and he still struggles to, to believe that Jesus can, can do this. Let's look at one more passage, real brief, John 14, passage you hear at every funeral, verses 1 to 11, let not your hearts be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house are many rooms, if it were not so, what I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. That's tabernacle language. And you know the way that I am going. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know how to get there. Like, we know the way. Jesus said, you got memorized. I'm the way, truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. It's almost like this is a typo, doesn't it? You expect it to say Peter, <laughs> right? Whoever asked the dumb question, his name is Peter, right? Sort of like uh, Ford was once asked if you can get the Model T in, in another color. He says, yeah, you can have any color you want as long as it's black, right? And you just assume if, if a dumb question is asked, Peter asked it. Not this time. It's your boy, Philly. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long? And you still do not know me. Remember, they're teenagers. Uh, whoever has seen me has also seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Um, I don't spend a lot of, this, a lot of time on this, but... Uh, we see here Philip on the eve of Jesus' crucifixion still struggling with understanding what all of this means. Um, and so when Jesus speaks of, I'm going to the Father, he struggles with the concept of the Trinity. Doesn't that make you feel better? Like if you think too much about the Trinity, you'll probably find yourself under your bed, sucking your thumb in the fetal position, reciting the Greek alphabet backwards. All right. But it is a necessary and beautiful doctrine of Christianity. What really what makes Christianity unique from any other religion in the history of man. And he seems to struggle with it some. Okay, so you're going to go to the Father, thus distinction. Show us the Father, it'd be enough for us. He says, but you have seen the Father. I'm the image. I, I, am, I am the Son of the Father. I and the Father are one. Okay, so there's distinction. If there's unity. If you can understand that perfectly... You were the first person in 2,000 years of church history to be able to do that. 
But it does show us the, in John's theology is that as the Father sends the Son, so the Son sends his disciples. And so you can't see the Father, but if you see the Son, you know exactly what he looks like, how he lives, how he acts, how he speaks. So too, if you can't see Christ, you should be able to see his disciples and know everything there is to know about Jesus. That's the point of discipleship, isn't it? To be just like the one in whom you are following. And Philip's got to learn this lesson. If Jesus is to mirror the Father, he is to mirror the Son. That's true for all of us. Well, how did their stories end? Um, well, we don't have really reliable information here, um, but we will do the best we can. According to tradition, uh, Philip uh, traveled uh, to Turkey and preached and apparently had a pretty good preaching ministry there. Um, we have some evidence of that. Uh, most accounts in terms of his death uh, say that he died early, um, may have even been the second or third disciple who was martyred. Uh, James being the first, we talked about that mentioned in, in Acts. John being the last, both brothers, ironically. Uh, but Philip seems to have died pretty early. Uh, and the dates sort of go back and forth, so I don't see the point in getting involved in all that. Most accounts say he was stoned in Heliopolis in Asia Minor, or Turkey, um, about eight years after the martyrdom of um, James. So, uh, in fact, we may, in 2017, I believe it was, we may have discovered his tomb. Would you like to see it? Boom, there it is. It's right here. In there. So the story goes. Um, whether or not it's true, I don't know. Um, I don't know what to think about a lot of this stuff, but it, it keeps your attention, so here we are. Um, uh, the story goes that he was, um, he was um, martyred there. He was stoned. And um, so that is supposed to be the location of where he was executed. Uh, years later, a church was planted there, uh, and the tomb was developed, put his body in, all that sort of stuff. Now, you go in there, there's, there was no body of Philip in there. We don't have it. Uh, what we think happened, and some tradition shows, his body ends up in Constantinople, uh, and then eventually the Rome. So as far as we know, his body is in Rome. But you know what I think about that. All right? I've made all the jokes. Uh, so whether or not it's the actual body of Philip... Uh, but from what I've read, there's some reliability that the dates are about right um, and the traditions seem pretty solid um, that that is where he was buried for a while. So, in terms of Nathaniel, your boy Nate, tradition says he ministered in Persia and in India and went as far as Armenia. Some of our uh, stories, traditions are him. By the way, Philip has some Gnostic Gospels named after him. There is the Acts of Philip, I think. I think there's the gospel. Is the gospel of Philip where Jesus and Mary supposedly kiss? Has anyone wasted their lives reading the Gnostics and can tell me? I think it's the gospel of Philip, if there is one. You're going to Google it tonight anyway, so if I'm right, let me know. Because this is all I want to do with the gospel of Philip. The Gnostics are terrible history. And yet these libs on TV, because they hate Jesus so much, won't you believe the Gnostics, not the more historical ones? Anyways, I think it is the gospel of Philip. There is also the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. So. I'm just curious, which of the uh, Gnostic Gospels is the craziest? The craziest? Yeah. Why don't we just go to a, a sane asylum and ask, which one of you all have had the worst childhood? <laughs> I think, I, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the answer. I don't know if it's Gnostic, but it's a pseudepigraphal gospel. It is called something like the gospel, the infancy gospel of Jesus when you turn the little boys into goats. It's very brief. You can read it. Uh, I'll try to send it to you if I think of it. If not, remind me. I'll try to get it to you. Uh, anytime I, I, I teach on how we got the Bible, maybe we'll do this one time. I'll read from it. Um, do you know it, Keith? Boom! Putting that cemetery uh, education together. And I didn't think anything good could come out of Owen County. But the story of, of Jesus turning the goats is Jesus was frustrated because none of the kids would play with him. So he turned them all into goats. And the mothers come and say, Jesus, uh, why did you turn our kids into goats? He said, because they won't play with me. Well, can you like undo it? He says, well, if you tell them to play with me, I'll turn them back into little boys. 
And that's what he did. That's it. It's an Aramaic gospel. So, y'all going to Google that now. You, you, you thinking I'm making this up. I've got it in my office. I can show it to you. Um, so to answer your question, it would be that. I do think the secret gospel of Mark, which is debatable, or this Gnostic or someone actually made it up um, just to sell books. Um, the cross, I mentioned this last week, the cross comes out of the uh, empty tomb, speaks, I've heard of that. and then ascends. That's a bizarre one. Um, but real quick on the Gnostics, uh, a lot of feminist theologians love the Gnostics, and they shouldn't because it's very sexist. In fact, in one of them, uh, it's maybe the either Philip or Gnostic Gospel of uh, Mary Magdalene. Jesus says that to get the next stage of, of um, uh, enlightenment, right? it's, it's very Oprah-ish, Gnosticism, um, Mary needs to become a man. Is that Gospel of Thomas? It might be. I don't know. It's been a while since I've read Thomas. I think that was it. The Jesus Seminar people, uh, you'd probably be fascinated by Jesus Seminar if, if you haven't oh, read them. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they are certifiable. Um, I think even Bart Ehrman thinks those guys are crazy. Well, they are. They are. They are. But they believe the Gospel of Thomas should be the fifth gospel. There's a 200-year gap between the Gospels and the Gospel of Thomas. Right. And, and they act like it's more reliable. And like the one narrative in it, he literally stole from Luke. It's, it's when, you know, he's, he's at the temple and right, the family has to come back and find. He just steal it from the Gospel of Luke. I mean, there's nothing original in it. Wait, remind me, I can send you, you like apologetics. I'll send you a, a lecture that, that he later put in a book. It, it uses names and place names as evidence of the Gospels. It's fascinating stuff. Um, okay, so, so he's an Armenian. According to tradition, Nathaniel died either by drowning or by crucifixion. Drowning was he was put in a sack and thrown into a sea. This was a, a pretty standard way of dying. I think I've told you that the, when the Anabaptists arose in the 16th century, we don't come from the Anabaptists directly, but there is some, they may be cousins. Anabaptists, we now call them Amish, Mennonites. Uh, they also went in other directions, but Menno Simons is where you get the Mennonites. He was a theologian, Anabaptist theologian. That's some weird stuff. One of them uh, that they did have was uh, baptism by immersion and believer's baptism. So they were called Anabaptists because that means re-baptizers. Everyone was baptized as babies, and now here come these people who are baptizing adults. And everyone thought that was strange. So what they did to the Anabaptists, both Protestants, like the Germans, the Lutherans, and the Catholics, they would put uh, people in barrels, put holes in the barrels, and throw them into the lake or sea. Uh, and the father's husbands would have to watch their family drown, and then they would drown. It was awful, awful what they do. So it wouldn't be uncommon for Nathaniel to die this way, especially if you're going around baptizing people. Makes sense. So... There you go. Um, that's the Philip and Nathaniel. That's almost everything we have on, the, on those two. It's not a, not a whole lot. Anything we may be missing or anything? You want to add thoughts, questions? Let me give you a couple of updates. One is uh, next Friday is our 5K uh, that we're going to be participating in. Um, and uh, so if you would like to give, we, we, we want to do a uh, fundraiser. It's a fundraiser. We're wanting to do a uh, food pantry for those in need. Uh, also, we are going to do our trunk or treat on October 25th. It's a Sunday evening. We're going to do it from 5 to 7. It is not going to be drive through It's going to be similar to what we've done in the past, where you're, you're going to set up your trunks. You want to decorate it, dress up, whatever. And what we're going to do is we're going to put a table uh, between the trunks and the treaters. Okay? Because that is actually going to be better in terms of distance than if we did a car. If you do a car, you're reaching in. This puts distance between people, and it's still more of your traditional trunk or treat. Um, and uh, we're going to have someone direct traffic, do all this. Probably have a couple people do it. Um, and we're going to hand out um, a uh, registration card as well as an uh, invitation to come worship with us. Uh, we, we've got like 500 of these. Um, but a registration card that you fill it out. We've done this in the past um, to win a uh, date night prize. Now, in the past, date night prize was dinner and a movie. It is now just dinner because of COVID. You cannot go to the movies. You can't go bowling. Uh, it's too cold to go mini golfing, I guess. So you're just going to go out to eat. And if you're in California, do not take off your mask. According to Babylon B, it's straight in your veins in California. So, um, so that's some of what we have planned, okay? 
Uh, if nothing else, y'all don't have